we're back at it again. Another episode of Quite Franklin. The Golden Gate Bridge is one of the most popular destinations in the world to attempt suicide. My next guest on the show, Kevin Hines, jumped from that bridge. It's 225 feet, about 25 stories, from the deck of the bridge down to the water. And even though the fall didn't kill him, he nearly drowned to death in the water from shattering two of his vertebrae. He couldn't move. Miraculously, a sea lion kept him afloat until the Coast Guard showed up to pick him up. Today on the show, Kevin shares his story, his experience with that and his struggles and recovery from that entire process. But more importantly, Kevin talks about the routines that he established for mental health. Now, these routines are things that I harp on all the time. They are not just routines for people who are struggling from mental health issues, but they can help people that would consider themselves mentally healthy. He talks about the establishment of a routine in your day. He talks about living a healthy lifestyle. He talks about the importance of fitness. He talks about the importance of nutrition. And all this is for, for brain health. But he makes a con connection from brain health to the gut brain and how these two things are interconnected. More importantly, though, my favorite story today that Kevin shares is how he met his wife. So it's not all heavy. Quite frankly, it's kind of unusual. It's quite, quite Franklin. Quite, got it. Quite Franklin. How are you doing today, brother? I'm doing good. Yeah, it says recording on my end, so we're good. By the way, I love the background, man. Thank you. I'm not set up because I'm down in my studio, but I need to give you a tour of my house because I have. Uh, I'll have to. I'll send you a picture later. I'll have a picture of the uh, Hulk and the thing squaring off in my living room, uh, like, like facing off. Oh, like, nice. Yeah. So, uh, it, it, it's pretty funny. And then if, I, I did that because I have a, uh, a lime green couch and an orange chase lounge. So anyway, <laughs> yeah. Awesome. That's awesome. Perfect. setup. Hey man, listen, uh, thanks. Thanks for coming on today, man. I really, really appreciate you, uh, taking the time to chat with me, man. Um, and by the way, I, I really, really, uh, enjoyed reading your book and getting to know your story, man. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. One of the things in the book that really struck me was uh, when you were telling the story, I, I think I'm going to kind of do this in a bit of a reverse order here, but when you were telling the story about when you were on the bus on the way to the bridge and how you kind of made a deal with yourself that if somebody said something, if somebody intervened, uh, that you, you know, that you wouldn't go through with, with jumping. And I thought about myself being on that bus. And I always like to think of myself as being like, the guy, the good guy in life, the guy that does the right thing. I mean, you have a bunch of superheroes behind you. I always like to think of myself as a superhero. You talk about that with you, with yourself. And I always, I always wonder like if I was the, if I was on the bus, would I've been the one that was, would have been able to identify the situation, be the one to intervene, be the one to, to, to actually stop that. And it was just a very powerful story for me. Wow. You know, it, it was, um, it's been quite the road and quite the journey. And you know, before I attempted to take my life off the Golden Gate Bridge, being on that bus, all I wanted was for one person to say, hey, kid, are you okay, brother? Is something wrong? Or how can I help you? And I would have told that person everything and begged them to save me. Um, you know, the fact is that my father tried to reach me that morning and I couldn't see it. And I was not uh, yet ambivalent. And I, and I, and I, um, I didn't want to die, but I believed I had to. And, and I always say those are two categorically different things. And in this desperate pain I was in, yes, I went to the Golden Gate Bridge and jumped off in, in, a, in a suicide attempt that is 98% fatal. As they say, 98% of the people that do that never again get to tell their story. So I'm just glad, Rich, that I'm here, that I get to exist, and I got a say in chance. Talking, Kevin, about like th this whole incident and everything with you, it was interesting because at the, I think it was the beginning of your book, maybe the foreword, I don't, I think it was before the first chapter, you talked about the brain having chemical imbalances. And for the people listening here, talking to them for a moment, they, you, you are actually on a drug that was helping you with epileptic seizures, but unbeknownst to you, it was also suppressing uh, some bipolar disorder that you had as well, correct? Yeah. So I was on a medication for bipolar disorder that was hindering, uh, pardon me, I was on a medication for epilepsy, for a seizure disorder that was hindering my bipolar disorder from being a parent because what they didn't know at the time was that that same medication was a very strong mood stabilizer and antidepressant. They, and they had no knowledge of this until later, later trialing through the, through, the, through the medication. And so being on that 
epileptic medication and then being abruptly removed from that from my system that med uh, because my brain scans for epilepsy were shown as normal so they were they took me off that medication in, in like a day and within within the weeks after that I, I spiraled into a complete uh, manic high and then crashed crashed into a depression um, and so uh, when I met my psychiatrist the first time uh, he saw me in a very depressed place and his assumption was that I was majorly depressed. And so he put me on majorly depressed medications. But that only skyrocketed me, skyrocketed me back into a manic episode, which is what happens when you actually have bipolar disorder. Uh, and the fact is that uh, I'm adopted, but both my biological parents had been diagnosed with uh, with manic depression, which they call bipolar, the very same brain disease I would, I would have. Uh, so I was genetically predisposed to the disease twice. So... It, at the beginning, I think it was the, uh, the forward, correct me if I'm wrong, Kevin, but you started talking about like the actual chemical imbalances in the brain because obviously you're taking medication, you were taking medications, these medications are suppressing this bipolar disorder that you have. Um, and oftentimes like people don't think, you, you talk about mental illnesses, things like bipolar disorder or paranoia or schizophrenia or any of these kinds of things, and you don't think about the fact that there's an actual biological chemical hormonal imbalance in the brain with these things. You just, even myself, I, you know, until, until I actually read your book, I, I, it's almost like you dismiss these things like, oh, well, he's just, he's bipolar. And you think of it as this problem, but there's not an actual real biological response to this problem. So obviously having, having this, this chemical imbalance in your brain, once you identify the problem that this medication has been suppressing that this is obviously something that you have to deal with for life, correct? Like you, you have, you have to learn how to manage and control this thing. Yeah. Currently there's no cure for, for mental illnesses, mental health conditions, as some like to call them. And, uh, you know, uh, whether you, whether you want to call it a chemical imbalance or an imbalance of chemicals or, or, uh, your brain chemistry got awry. The fact is that, uh, you're, you're, there's a couple of things going on here. You've got two brains. You've got your gut brain, your gut health, and your gut biomes that are directly connected to your brain chemistry. And then you've got your, your your brain and your head, and and they're 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 interconnected. They're 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 physiologically connected, um, and and one can't act without the other. And so if you're if you're if you're even if you're eating poorly most of the time, you're literally damaging your brain, and what I and you're you're, you're causing what I call brain pain. And then you have the brain pain just from the mental struggle alone. You couple those together and it's complete chaos. And, and so, you know, part of what we have to do as a society of people that we that that can that agree that mental illnesses are real as the hands in front of my face is work toward all of the avenues to getting better and staying stable. So a lot of the times I meet people that are eating just overwhelming amounts of processed foods and they're wondering why they're mentally unhinged. Well, a lot of that has to do with the food you're eating. A lot of that has to do with your nourishment or lack thereof, uh, a lack of proper nutrients to feed that because your brain is the, arguably the most important muscle you have. And if you're not feeding it properly, you're going to be in trouble. So let me let me ask you, and uh, I'll, I'll use quotation marks when I say this on quote uh, apparently healthy people that don't have any kind of mental issue. What, would you are you suggesting then that people that are eating processed foods and things like that, unhealthy lifestyles, that it's taking their brain out of balance as is? No, it definitely is. It definitely is. I mean, it's our 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 gut to brain health is so important. You know, and, and I I've gone to places where I've like. I've eaten poorly for a long time and I feel horrible, feel down in the dumps. Um, I'm agitated easily. I'm aggressive easily. Um, uh, I'm definitely mentally unstable. Um, and then when I get back into a, a good, good eating habits, you know, the, the healthy is different for each person, but I hate to use that term because it's such a polarizing term, but, but, but when you eat foods that are filled with nutrients and minerals that are healthy for the body and the mind, and you do your research and you know what those foods are, basically inflammatory versus non-inflammatory foods, you can have a, a, a genuine awesome effect on the betterment of your brain. And I, I call it sanity over vanity. You know, it's like, it's, like you, you, it's not about what you look like on, with, with no shirt off. It's like what, what matters is what you're feeding yourself to feed your brain to, so that you can be in the best mental shape possible. 
And so, you know, with my diagnosis of bipolar disorder, there's a few things I do every day to stabilize. I, I exercise, I eat healthy foods, most meals, I educate myself as to my diagnosis. This is one of the most important things I can do. Reading every book and article and vlog and blog about bipolar disorder, depression, and suicide prevention that I can get my hands on. And, you know, it's easy. I've, I've got a Google alert for those three things. So they come in every day. I, I download them. And then I add those reputable proven forms of treatment and therapy into my regimen. And then I'm all that more better for it. And, and I'm staying stable uh, to the best of my ability. But I'll tell you, Rich, like I last like three, four months, I've been in a rut. I've been in uh, quite a bit of a depression. And I'm, 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 I'm very honest about the fact that, you know, I, I'm not recovered. This is me in recovery every day, one day at a time. And I, and I, and I, and I live, stay and find myself here in recovery. Um, and I fight my pain. I still have chronic thoughts of suicide, but I'll never die that way because every time I'm suicidal today, I reach out to my wife or my father or my friends or my doctors or all of the above. And I say four simple but effective words. I need help now. Um, and that's where I am now. I'm, I'm in a place of self-awareness with suicidal ideation. So I will never end up that way because of how hard I work to stay stable. Um, and, and, and for your audience to know, I, I've, got, I've got a lot of resources. I'd love to share them with you. If that's okay. Love to. If, if you are looking for places to go to find ways to better your brain, mind, behavioral, mental, and physical health and well-being, you can go to youtube.com slash Kevin Hines. There, is, there are 500 plus videos all designed to help you better your brain health. Um, and one of those videos is the Art of Wellness 2.0, a 10-step guide to better, better, better mental well-being. It's a quick guide. It's simple. They're common sense tools. They're science-backed, evidence-informed. I follow them every day. It's how I stay above water, no pun intended. And then you, you can go to kevinhinesstory.com. Uh, slash resources and find three resources there. The Art of Wellness in PowerPoint form, which you can train as a trainer. Uh, you can teach people the, the, the Art of Wellness from that PowerPoint. You'll find uh, a, a parents and teacher's guide to teen mental, health, teen mental health and suicide prevention uh, to help your kids with suicide prevention. That's written by some of the greatest suicidologists in the field, including my, and, as well as my wife, who's a partner on that paper. And that's, that's one of the most heavily downloaded in the field. And then you can go to the guide for the YouTube channel and see what YouTube videos will help with what mental struggle. So those are three, uh, no, four resources for you. Take them. They're yours. They're free. Um, and, 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 you know, just it's, it's, it's easy for me to say, and it, this, this falls under the suicide prevention guys. It's, it's really easy for all of us to say you're not alone, but that's not fair enough. I want to say, I don't know what it's like to feel alone. And, and in saying that, I want to relate to you and your audience and say that you can get through whatever pain or struggle you're going through. It's a matter of time, effort, and hard work to, to balance yourself out to the best ability you can. And uh, I know that I won't always feel great, but I know that I'll always fight to feel better. So, Kevin, these resources that, that you just laid out for the audience, I, I would imagine that these things would be helpful for people who would not necessarily classify themselves as someone who's struggling with depression or mental health issues right. as well. Right. Because when you talk about like, when you talk about the, the gut, the gut brain and the actual, you know, brain and the, the connection between the two of these things, even seemingly healthy people can benefit from this stuff, correct? Absolutely. And, you know, not just that, but like the, the, even the 10 step routine is something that anyone can do who wants to better their life, better their well being, if you will. You know, uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of people write to me who are autistic and living with autism and, and Asperger's syndrome and say that the 10 steps helps them. There's a lot of people that say that they don't have a mental health diagnosis, but they are following the 10 step regimen, you know, besides let's say the medication part and they're doing really well on it. And they're, and they're, and they're, they're finding themselves feeling better than they were before they started. And then there's the folks that live with mental health conditions that write to me from all over the world, from as far as Peru, Africa, China, Japan, all across Europe. Canada and America that write and say, in six to nine months of following this program, I dramatically improved my mental health. Who doesn't want that? If it's right there in front of you and it's clear as day and it's working for most people, go for it. You know, um, and, and, I'll, and I'll, let me tell you where I found the inspiration 
to write this program. And I wrote it with a clinician. So it wasn't just something I whipped up myself and didn't have peer reviewed. Um, uh, I, I, I actually was in my third psych ward stay of nine. I've been, I've, I've had nine psych ward stays in the last 14 years, the last being in 2019 before the pandemic. And, uh, I'm in the psych ward in the third psych ward stay, the third involuntary psych ward stay, forced in against my will. Uh, and my uncle comes in with a Time magazine rolled up in his hand. And he says, Kevin, your family can help you until we're blue in the face. But until and when you take 110% responsibility for the fact that you have this disease and you fight it tooth and nail, kid, ain't nothing going to change. You'll be in and out of these places for the rest of your life. Is that what you want? And I said, no, Uncle George. He said, well, get it together, kid. We're counting on you. And he kind of mic dropped this magazine on the on the table. And I opened it. It was a Time Magazine article from 2004 that read How to Fight Bipolar Disorder, Depression, and Mental Illness with Routine and Regimen and Win, right? And so I looked, looked at this. I opened it up. And here are all these things you can do to balance your brain health. And I took that back to my room. And I read the article through and through twice. And I put, I put those words into action, built my own regimen and routine that was inspired by this article. Uh, and I've been following it ever since, and it's, it's, it hasn't steered me wrong. I've lived now 20 years past my initial attempt while thinking of suicide a million times, but never again attempting. And so I want to express that to your audience is that you can get to a place where your thoughts of suicide don't have to become your actions. Yeah. You know, when I was like, as, as I began to dive into learning more about you and everything, I almost felt like I was reading about a professional athlete as regimented as you are about your routine, waking up at the same time and getting your cardiovascular in and all that kind of stuff. I was like, man, this guy has, this guy has more of a regimented routine than half of the professional athletes that I know in the world. Well, to be fair, I, I did. And, and, and I, and I've, I've, uh, during COVID, cause I was, I was, I was literally in the, you know, as they say, the best shape of my life pre COVID COVID hit and I, I fell into this bit of a depression and I, I'm just going to be frank with you. I gained, gained a bunch of weight, uh, was eating poorly, but luckily and greatly I'm, I'm back on track for the last few weeks, eating those non-inflammatory foods and back to exercising every day. Uh, and it's going to take some time to get back into the, in the fighting shape that I, that I really was. Um, but, but really the best part about doing these things every day is that I feel so much better now and I'm coming out of that depression um, and it's really helping me. So proof positive that you can do the work for a really long time. You can fall off and you can get right back on the horse and keep on riding forward. Was it, was it too much Taco Bell during COVID? Is that what happened? I know, I know you expressed your <laughs> love. <laughs> I know you expressed your love for Taco Bell. What you was it? Read, you did read my book. You I definitely read my book. I told you, man. I don't, like, if I say I read something, man, I'm not lying about it. So. No, I know. I know. I know. No, what, what was, uh, what was your go-to guilty pleasure during COVID, man? You know, it really, I, I, my go-to was like salami sandwiches, gotcha. you know, just like just filled to the brim with, you know, unhealthiness. That's the, Ital I guess that's the Italian in you, I'm, I'm assuming. Yeah, you bet. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you know, you talked about putting on the weight uh, during COVID, all that kind of stuff coming out of COVID. I'm assuming as well. Being being in lockdown, I mean, because are you you're still San Francisco based, correct? No, I'm in Atlanta. Oh, oh, I didn't realize. Okay, yeah, San Francisco first thirty four years of my life. My wife and I moved out here about six years ago. During during the lockdown, I mean, I, I'm assuming you hit kind of a depressive state. Your uh, your your fitness just completely fell off. Obviously, all the gyms were closed, but I'm assuming like you weren't keeping up with any kind of road work or anything like that, like getting your runs in, five Ks, none of that kind of stuff either. Then. No, I was. I really wasn't. I really wasn't. I, I hit a rut mentally, and I just, I just kind of stopped everything. And for for about three weeks now, I'm back on board with everything, and it, it, and I'm feeling so much better. You know, it, it's. Uh, I've got my, I've got my push up pegboard. I've got my Peloton. I've got my Bowflex Revolution, and I'm filled. I'm I'm going back and forth between the three. And I'll, I'll be I'll be back to the the way I was in, in no time uh, because I'm dedicated I'm driven um, and diligent about it now again. Um, but it, it was just a, I, I just got into a bad place. I don't know how else to describe it. Um, you know, it's um, you know those, those bad habits can creep in and they can affect your 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 outcomes. And but now that now that I'm pushing forward, I, I feel completely confident that. In the next three months, I'll be back to the place I want to be. Do, 
Do you, in order to motivate yourself, do you set uh, any kind of goals? Like, are, do you say like, oh, I'm going to go run this 5K, or I'm going to do this triathlon, or I'm going to do this bodybuilding competition? Do you need things like that to get you motivated? No, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm when, when I'm on point, I'm really good about waking up, doing my deep breathing, now looking at my phone, going downstairs to the basement, doing the work. And then, uh, and then coming up and spending some time with my lovely wife. Is she, is she, uh, into fitness like you are or not, not her thing? Um, she, she, she's, she doesn't work out too often. I think she like, she, she's very intellectual. So she'll, she'll, she'd rather read a book or, uh, or make a business deal or, you know, uh, be, 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 she works all day long. I mean, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a balance. Okay. So talk to me just since we're on, on the subject of fitness and nutrition, what, what is your, uh, what is your breakfast? You, you do the same kind of breakfast every day when you're on or are you, you vary things I, up? I do. So it's my, my, my daily routine is wake up oatmeal or, or, or gluten-free cream of wheat. And then, uh, afternoon, uh, two hours later is a, a, a shake with, with, uh, just minimal, minimal fruit, uh, quite a bit of greens, um, a, a liquid of choice, like a, like a, like a macadamia milk or something like that. Uh, and then for lunch, it's usually, uh, you know, a, a breast of chicken, some asparagus, uh, rustic potatoes, something like that. Uh, and then the snack after that is usually, uh, a pear, a mango or, or, or some greens. And then dinner, I usually go light with, uh, a salad with topped with some chicken or salmon. Um, that's kind of my, those are my, when I'm, when I'm really getting into my wellness routine, that, that, that's kind of my, my regimen for the day. You, you, you grew up, uh, playing sports. Like obviously, I mean, you played football, fairly successful football, you wrestled in, in high school and stuff like that. Like, what do you do then? And how does this affect like mental health, like, like for that competitive side of you? I'm sure you have like this thirst for competition at some level. You know, I think I, I, I let that go when I, when I, when I had my, my back surgery. Oh, really? Because I can't, I can't, uh, I can't compete in, uh, in, uh, contact sports and contact sports are my favorite. So not being able to physically compete in contact sports because of how dangerous it is to my back. I've got a metal plate and cage in my back that yeah. one tweak the wrong way and I'm, I'll be paralyzed. And that's, that's how the doctors in, 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 explain it to me. Like you, you can't play football. You can't wrestle. You, you can't play hockey. You can't, uh, ski, you can't water ski. You can't go on it right at right. You can't even ride, a, ride on a wave runner. Cause if you hit the water the wrong way, you're, you're in trouble. Mm. You know, when I, when I jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge, I missed severing my spinal cord by two millimeters. Yeah. So that metal plate is very sensitive and any impact to it can be very dangerous. So right now I focus on what I can do physically. And that's, that's really downstairs with those, th those two machines and, and that, that pegboard. Yeah, I just didn't know. If, I mean, well, I listen. I get it if you're into contact sports because I would rather go in the gym and uh, you know <clears throat> spar for an hour than go out and run a 5K for 25 minutes. You know, like it's like right. uh, as far right. as as far as staying you know, and, fit. And spe speaking of sparring, I would love. You know, it, you know, one of the things I want to do is is learn how to box, but not with a not not by fighting other people. I want to just. I, I definitely see myself in the future training. At, like a boxer would. Um, and, 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 and I, and I've got a friend who wants to help me do that. So I'm looking forward to opening that door and seeing where it takes me. You know, really, Kevin, if you're, if you are, were interested in boxing and you find the right trainer, uh, anybody that can hold, you know, feed mitts for you, somebody that knows how to do that properly can make it feel like you're actually sparring, like, you know, getting your nervous system yes. to fire properly. And, you know, when you pop that jab out and you're not moving side to side the way you're supposed to, suddenly you're getting you're smacked in the face back with a pad and stuff like that. Like it can feel like you're sparring. It's a good workout and there's, there's a competitive, uh, angle to it. For sure. Yeah, I'm definitely gonna you know gonna go for that. I've actually got a friend out in Los Angeles. Uh, he, he goes between Los Angeles and New York. They call him Hollywood Hino. He was the uh, he was the uh, the show Sylvester Stallone's the contender runner up in the fourth season. Actually, I think in Singapore. Um, and and he uh, he's a he's a, a, a great guy. And we're we're gonna be working together, and he's gonna be training me sometime soon. Cool, cool, man. So then 
all right. Talk to me because I've I've also had Wim Hof on my show and the breathing exercises that he does and stuff like that. We didn't talk about mental health as it as it applies to breathing. I I utilize breathing exercises with my training uh, primarily as. Uh, a means to dispel or my body to deal with uh, carbon carbon dioxide, like, but I don't ever really mm. think about it in terms of like my mental health. Talk, talk to me about that. I'm actually asking you this to educate me at this point in time. Like, what? The, oh no, absolutely, it's so important. So what I do every day is is three three times a day I do resonance breathing. I wake up and I take 30 resonance breaths, which is inhaling through your nose for four seconds, holding for four seconds releasing eight seconds through pursed lips like a whistle, but no sound and doing that 30 times. That's how I wake up every morning. That's how I woke up today. Um, and it sets your day. It sets your mind. Um, and it makes you, makes you push everything in your, in your thought pattern out and focus on just your breath. And you, and then the key is to just listen to your breathing and not listen to your mind's chatter. Cause we, we have, you know, we have so many thoughts during the day from the moment we wake up to the moment we go to bed at night it's important to take that time to do your residence breathing, to bring yourself back to a calm, even if you just, just, just even though you're just rising. So I do it, at, I do it in the morning. I do it right before lunch and I do it right after dinner. Um, and it's extremely beneficial for me because when I have, because I deal with panic and anxiety. And when I'm dealing with those things, I also do residence breathing to bring myself back to a calm. And here's why a couple of things. It lowers your blood pressure, lowers your blood sugar, lowers your heart rate, quells a panic attack, an anxiety attack, or an adrenaline rush to a calm. It's an amazing tool and technique for your better mental health. Um, don't do resonance breathing like I'm suggesting. If you already have low blood pressure, that is bad. I'm just putting that disclaimer out there right now. You have to find another form of breathing for yourself. Um, but 88% but of the population is not breathing properly around the world, which means we're, we're when we get aggressive or angry or upset, we have short, shallow breaths. Well, that's depleting the oxygen from your brain, which is affecting your brain's functionality, which is then affecting your mental health. So if you're focusing three to four times a day on your breathing, on properly breathing, then you are feeding that brain so you can pro ha have the brain's functionality work at a higher capacity. It's fantastic. And it's, it's, good for, it's good for literally everybody. And even if you have low blood pressure, if you look it up online, there are ways you can find ways to to do breathing exercises that fit your lifestyle. When you when you talk about breathing exercises, like I'm kind of thinking about my conversation with Wim Hof. We were talking about this stuff, and he was talking about how um, you could actually actually do measurable differences with the endocrine system. Like he was he was actually able to voluntarily change his adrenaline levels. For example, have you ever had yeah. had these kind of like markers in your brain measured specifically because you've dealt with bipolar disorder? You know, that's fascinating. I've never had it measured scientifically, and that's a, it's a great idea, but I, I probably should. Yeah. Um, but I can physically feel the change. Yeah, yeah. I, I, would, I mean, I would imagine. I mean, honestly, some, that's oftentimes the best science, right? I mean, if you're going to, I don't know, if you're going to eat a certain food that's whatever, like you can eat too much spices and like you could eat a certain spicy food and that spicy food to you is like, no, I'm fine. I could eat a certain spicy food and it's like, okay, if I take one more bite of this, like, so there is no like kind of prescription. For example, I'm using food as an analogy here, but the same thing could be done obviously with medications because a medication or breathing or any kind of thing like that, working out, it doesn't matter. It'll, we're all genetically different. And so it can affect you yeah. one way differently than another. Um, but then the question is like, is with these, when, when you're assessing like mental health issues, are there, I'm a numbers guy. My, my, my background's in mathematics. So I always think in numbers and I, I can't stop my brain from thinking that way. But is there like a certain, <laughs> is there a certain set of parameters where like your hormones and all these markers should be that's actually measurable? And if you're outside of that, then you're just like, it's like, if you're outside of these markers, then it'll show that you possibly have by like a mental health issue or is it just everybody is uniquely different with these hormone levels? You know, I, I really do believe that everybody is different with these hormone levels. I'm, I, I personally don't know the markers that you would need to obtain to be ab above or below that certain space to be safe. What I can tell you is that living with bipolar disorder and being consistently on these highs and lows, like, like jumping up into a manic euphoric natural high and then crashing into depression because once you go up, you must come down, you know, experiencing that so often, um, you have to find a way to bring yourself back to, to, to an even keel. 
And that's what, that's what that breathing does for me. You know, when I'm too manic and my wife will say, Kevin, you're, you're talking a mile a minute. I don't know what you're saying. I need you to calm down. Or I'll say it to myself being self-aware. I will then do the breathing until the mania has dissipated. And I can sense a, I can sense a shift in my mind and my body when I do that. So I know I'm actually taking part in physically making that change. Same thing goes to when I'm, when I fall into that depressive side and I'm really down and I'm upset, I'm hurting. I'll, I'll get to my push up board and I'll, I'll do, you know, anywhere between 160 to 300 push ups, And when I come off that board, I'm feeling so much better. I'm, I, I feel, I feel a weight lifted from my shoulders. Um, uh, and it, it's very helpful. Um, and it's all about, it's all my biggest thing and, and like biggest request of people who are going to mental pain is don't sit idly by with your struggle and do nothing. Take action, take action, whether that be a breathing exercise for your mania or, or, or your anxiety or your panic, or that be a physical walk with a loved one when you're depressed, or that be you getting down to the ground and getting to work. Uh, if you're physically capable, you've got to do the work. And, and, th and that's what people don't get is they're too, they're, they're, they're looking for the quick fix. They want their mental struggles to go away now. And they're, they're and they're complaining, frankly, I'll be honest with you, they're complaining about it instead of taking action. And so I'm a big, I'm a big take action guy. And when I was for the last three months pr during, during COVID uh, and, and, and gaining all that weight and eating poorly and all that, you know, I, I lost that aspect of myself. I, I lost the taking action aspect of myself. I've since got it back. I'm on a routine again. I'm really happy about it. And I'm going to continue it because it makes me feel so much better. Yeah, this, and, but this yeah. quick fix that you're talking about, Kevin, this is not just, <clears throat> not just people with mental health issues. This is everybody. You know how it goes. If somebody comes to you and is like, hey, Kevin, I'm, I'm sure with you being on the, the fitness regimen that you've been on, the routines that you have, you probably have a lot of people that come to you and like, hey, how can, I, how can I lose weight? Help me with my diet. Help me with my workout routine. Yeah. And in the end, a lot of people just want that quick fix. They want to be able to take that pill that makes them lose all that weight. They don't want to put that time in. Yep. And, and that's what it takes with your routines and stuff though. The, the, okay. You talk about breathing, you talk about doing pushups and you talk about how this can uh, alter your state meant like from a mental perspective, like you can feel these things working <clears throat> your routines and breathing exercises and all the things that you can implement to, to better you. Can that 100% ever replace your medications? I've tried several times to come off meds. Yeah. And I always end up falling into psychosis. My, my diagnosis, my, my struggle is very severe. When I am not on meds, I see and hear things that don't exist to anyone but me. I sometimes still do, but when I'm not on meds, it's, it's a lot worse. Hearing voices all day long that, that nobody else can hear. Seeing hallucinations that look so vibrantly real, you feel like you can touch them. And I haven't been able to find a world where I can come off those meds safely. Yeah. I still have hopes that there'll be treatments that come along down the line that allow me to do so. And I do recognize that, um, that certain foods can play a big role in me potentially trying to come off psych meds. Um, but I have to be careful because when I get to the place of hallucinatory episodes, and paranoid delusions that are so powerful. That's when the suicidal ideations become more than ideations. They become thoughts to take action. Yeah. And so for, for me, being in this place where I'm, I'm, I, I may be, I may be a little depressed these last few months, but I'm, I'm stable. I'm, I'm safe. I'm safe from myself. Um, and, you know, living 20 years with this diagnosis and 20 years taking meds, uh, and, 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 and going off them sometimes and trying to titrate down and, uh, or just taking myself off them immediately, you know, abruptly, which is dangerous. And I don't, I don't recommend for anybody do it with a doctor's perspective, uh, or help. Um, I don't feel like I, to, a long winded answer is to say, I don't think that right now I can get off meds. Yeah. Um, I hope to find a way someday to taper off safely with a doctor and just utilize food as medicine. 
I think that's within the realm of possibility. I, I have high hopes for that. The reason why I ask this question, I think, is because as I, I, I don't have a whole lot of experience with mental illnesses, as I would imagine a lot of a lot of the listeners probably will not as well. But as I was reading your book and getting to know your story, I almost felt like uh, reading about an addict you know, kind of very similar traits as somebody who's addicted to a substance or something like that, where you can consistently continue falling into relapses and those kinds of things. And obviously, if, if you've dealt with any kind of people that have addictions, you know, the importance of routines, getting them out of uh, like, for example, like removing somebody from this, the social circle that they were in, in order to avoid all those triggers that would otherwise create that relapse back into the addiction. And I kind of, I, I felt the same kind of way, um, reading, like, especially reading your book that if I was in your close inner circle, I would, it, knowing how to deal with an addict would help me know how to w understand your circumstances as well. Does that make sense? I always say that, that much like an addict or much like someone living with substance use disorder, I'm in recovery every day. I'm not recovered. I'm not well. I live with fight, battle and thrive despite of this, of this condition. And I'm in, I'm in recovery every day, one day at a time. And some days are great. Some days are terrible. Some days are worse than terrible. But I always get back up. I always march forward. And I always ask for help. And I think that's the key is like people forget that 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 they have the tools and the power to ask for help. Uh, and, and thus they, they internalize everything and they silence their pain. And when you silence your pain, you're, you're only letting it eat you alive. And it just bubbles and festers and grows until it bursts in things like rage, aggression, violence, substance use disorder, suicidal thoughts, ideas, or actions, and all types of other things. But when you unburden yourself and you, you, you tell the truth about your pain, a pain shared becomes a pain halved. And that's really where I find myself is that every time I've been in pain and I've told someone I've gotten the help I need. Uh, and, and it wasn't always the first person I told. Sometimes the first, second, third, fourth, fifth person I told wasn't willing to help me or able to help me or even able to empathize, but I kept fighting to find that one person that would help me stabilize my pain. And when, when I, and since I met my wife and she's become my rock and my best friend, you know, she's that go-to person now that I have find your go-to person, find your peer personal protector, recognize that you don't have to fight this alone. Um, and that if you feel alone, like I did in the past, being in halfway homes for the mentally ill, having my situations where my family wouldn't take me home from a psych ward, they need me to get well on my own, you know, I've been there. So, so knowing that I've, in that I've been in those places and I came to where I am today with a loving wife, a, a, a better family relationship with those who love me, um, a, a godson and goddaughter I saw be born into this world. None of that would have happened if I took my life. So, you know, it, it, what I say to people is we're all going to die. We're all, we're not, none of us are immortal. None of us are vampires. We're all going to die. Give yourself time plus that hard work for things to change. I'll say this, and I mean this when I say it, this was a really life-changing book for me, like getting to know your story. Because as I read your book and I re or read some of the stuff that you're dealing with, I think that um, th this, the kind of things you talk about are could be helpful. Like your help guides and things like that, they're, they can help people that would be, as we would say, quote unquote, normal, right? I mean, people that don't have mental health disorders, just the routines and stuff like that. Because all of us, Everybody goes through, I don't know, t uh, times of depression where whether it's something like COVID and you not being able to see loved ones or you're, you're quarantined in a household or something like that to, uh, you know, t t times where you question yourself, question your abilities or wh whatever it is, like fears that we have that drive us. And so w as I was like, as I was thumbing through some of your stuff, I'm like, man, this is really helpful information, not just, not just for the people, like not just for somebody who's attempted suicide or would attempt suicide. I've always kind of... I guess consider myself a fairly normal person, maybe. I don't know. You could ask some of the people around me. They might disagree. But at the same time, you know, as I was reading your book, this is what I thought to myself when you talked about the drug that you were taking for epilepsy. I've been able to uh, to compete professionally as an athlete my whole life. So I've had this combative sport in my life that's almost like a drug for if I'm ever feeling aggressive or something like that. I can just go to the gym. I can spar. I get to punch somebody in the face. I can hit a bag. I can relieve my frustration, <laughs> right? So it's like I have this, like like you, I have this drug. And I wonder to myself, if I completely remove that from my life, 
what would happen to my psychosis, right? And so as I was as I was reading your book, I was like, man, there's so much good information in here. Just l- learning how to uh, take care of yourself mentally for somebody who's who believes that they're not dealing with those kind of problems. Absolutely. And in that book, and that book is called "Crack Not Broken: Surviving and Thriving After a Suicide Attempt." Shameless plug. But that book, um, if at the end of it is a living mentally well most days guide. And that's what I turn into the art of wellness. So it's in the book in it's book form, but it's, and it's on the website and it's PowerPoint form, but it's also on that YouTube channel in, in video form, which is, I think the easiest for people to download in their minds. Media is the fastest way to reach anybody right now. That's why we're doing this podcast. I mean, you know, and so, you know, I think that if you took that aspect of your life out of, out of existence, if you, if you stop sparring, I think it would affect your, your mental well-being because it's what you love. It, 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 isn't it a part of your passion? Isn't it, you're talented at it, you're gifted at it, and it's a passion for you. And, 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 and it was a career for you for a long time. So, you, you know, you're, you're doing that. It's almost part of your DNA now. Yeah. It's almost something you have to do, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think I think it's been part of my DNA my whole life. That's why that's why I asked you before about competing or setting up some sort of physical goal competition or whatever. Because I've been involved in sports since I was a young kid. I started playing football at the age of eight, right? And I played until I graduated high school, essentially, and as well as many other sports. But football was my first love. Is not God didn't grant me the gifts that I needed to uh, to pursue that sport at a higher level. Uh, fortunately for me, martial arts came along. But I've essentially I've been an athlete my entire life since since I can remember almost. And so removing that from my life would be, I'm sure, more than detrimental. Yeah, and I think that's why I want to. That's why I want to go from just working out in my basement to getting in a, a, a boxing gym and getting to work, you know, because that's going to, that's going to, that's going to up the ante and it's going to, it's going to give me a, it's going to set my goals a little higher and my, what I'm going to achieve from those goals w- is more of a, uh, maybe a competitive nature than I would if I was just down in my basement doing my, you know, bike and my Bowflex and my, my pushup board it's going to give me some, uh, ex- ex- put some excitement back into working out and, and training like a, like a real athlete, like I used to. Yeah, absolutely. You being in, being in a gym like that, that, I always say there's strength in numbers, you know, when you're around other people in an environment like that, that environment just, bre- it, it, it breeds like a competitive drive in you too. Even if you're not competing in the sense that we're sparring every day or whatever that, that may be, it's like you, you, you have to come in like, man, I got to be here because these guys are dependent on me to show up for this workout or whatever. I, I'm part of this group now or whatever those things may be that are, that are driving you. Obviously you have, um, accountability. That would be the word I'm looking for. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Hey, so you mentioned, you mentioned your wife being like that rock, that, that one person that's the most stable person in your life. Can you tell, tell the story about how you met her? Cause it was, it's, it's actually, quite, <laughs> it's so funny. Absolutely. It's awesome. It's an awesome absolutely. story. Yeah, no, I met her in my third psych ward stay of nine. And she was coming there to visit her cousin who was in there for drug use, illicit drug use. And uh, he had become catatonic. He couldn't move and he couldn't talk. And every day I would sit with this young man. I would tell him story after story after story, trying to elicit a response. And he would never move or say anything until one day he looks up and he goes, geez, man, you talk too much. I know your whole life story. Can you leave me alone? Everybody in the room starts clapping because this kid wouldn't talk. And, and, you know, they would bring him his tray of food and they'd take it away an hour later full. And maybe it broke my heart. So I get him talking and he's like, get away from me. But the thing about this kid was, unlike anybody in the hospital that was staying there at the time, which had, who had like no visitors. And I I had very few. um, He had 15 to 22 people come to see him every day. And it would pile up in the waiting area, which was this tiny room next to the elevator. Uh, that you had, to be, you had to be led into a key to get in. And only two could come in at a time during visiting hours. And they all kind of piled in every 15 minutes. They'd switch, switch out people. And I find myself basically uh, volunteering for the psych ward I'm living, I'm living in. Uh, and, and, and having one of my case managers allow me to volunteer for a psych ward, which is highly irregular and highly illegal. You, it's, you're not supposed to do that. <laughs> but I convinced her to allow me to, to volunteer as a, in the hospital I was staying in. And in doing so, everyone there is wearing hospital gowns, hospital pants, hospital slippers, 
I'm wearing a Ralph Lauren double rested polo suit in a 70s yellow thread collar, like some kind of gangster runs the place. Cause I found it in the giveaway clothes closet that I had to clean. <laughs> and the next day I'm wearing like a pink polo shirt with khaki cargo shorts and sandals from the giveaway clothes closet that fit, fit me right out of the box. And, and I got a clipboard and a pen and a notebook and I'm making the afternoon visiting hour announcements on the PA system, which is like this big mic that you, you would drop down for a boxing match, kind of a mic, like, you like know, Michael Buffer coming from those, the old, ceiling. Yeah. One of those old timey mics, you know, except it's coming out from a different, different stand. Yeah. And I'm making the announcement. I'm rhyming them because it's more efficient. And basically this woman taps me on the left shoulder. And I turn around and there she was. And I was done. I knew she'd be the rest of my life. And I was like, just don't, don't ruin this. Don't say anything. Just chill. And she goes, excuse me, do you work here? Just like that. And the entire nursing staff was right there. And they all looked at me like, what is this jackass going to say? And I, and I looked at them like, you better be quiet or we'll talk about my illegal activities here. And, <laughs> and then <laughs> and so she, I said, as a matter of fact, miss, I am a volunteer. And they didn't say anything. They were quiet. I said, I'm looking for my cousin. His name is, do you know which room he's in? I said, madam, right this way. And I put my hand on the small of her back and her elbow, and I, I glided her there, which she thought was really weird later. <laughs> but I get her to the room, and the kid sees me, and he hates me. Uh, and, and I duck out into the hallway, um, and I hear her say to him, your nursing staff is so nice. And he literally says, that guy? That guy is a nutball. That guy jumps off bridges. Don't talk to that guy. She comes out, she goes, why'd you lie to me? And I said, Margaret, I didn't lie to you. I'm a volunteer at this very hospital. I just happen to also live here. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was it was wild. And so she's in the hospital every day visiting him. And one day I walk up to her and I go, hey, Margaret, you know, when I get out of here, can I take you to coffee? And she looks at me and I swear, she looked at the entire H-shaped hallway of the, of the psych ward. And she goes, oh, honey, hell no, you know? And there was like, there, you could, like in that moment, I felt so defeated. Like there's no way she'll ever go out with me. And the love of my life is, is just going to, just going to drift away and it's over. And so the kid gets out of the hospital. I get out of the hospital and I call Margaret up one day and I go, hi, Margaret, it's Kevin. And she goes, Kevin, and I go, Kevin Hines. She goes, Kevin Hines. I said, from the psych ward. And she goes, oh, hi, Kevin. How did you get this phone number? And I was like, that's not important. Let's move on. I said, Margaret, it, it's a funny, I, 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 it's, it's Friday. I really like to take you to dinner. And I'm, I'm staying at a halfway home and I'm living off of $3 a day. I have no way to take this woman to dinner. You know, I just, I just went for it. And, you know, so she goes, oh, you know, I don't. And I was like, listen, Mario, if it goes south, you never have to see me again. Just one date. That's all I'm asking for. Please. And she goes, okay, fine. You know, just reluctantly. So I show up at her door, but there's a problem. I show up with a giant ski duffel bag with lots of my things. And she goes, what is that? I said, it's a funny story, Mario. When you leave the halfway home on a Friday and you go out past 9 p.m., you made reservations at 9. You kind of can't go back to the halfway home until Monday. She goes, oh, hell no. And I said, Margaret, I will take this bag. I will lay on those stairs over there, and I will sleep on those stairs. They were the lumbar stairs. I'll sleep on those stairs in San Francisco, and in the rain even. But we have to go on this date. I came all this way. And she goes, oh, God, fine. So we go to this restaurant, Cafe Sport, and you don't order at Cafe Sport. They look at you, they judge you, and they order for you. It's an old uh, old uh, Italian mafia hangout. Got it. And, and it's a tiny restaurant. And the tables are so small, like that. And then you're elbow to elbow with the next person next to you. And or the, you know, the people next to you. And, uh, and they order me, they order her her favorite Italian meal, egg pan parmesan. Well, hold on, wait a minute. Hold, I got I to gotta interrupt. How, did you, how are you paying for dinner at this point in time? I, I don't know. I have no <laughs> idea. Oh, you still don't know? This get, I have no idea. This, oh, this gets worse. Is, this gets even better. Okay, so, go. So... so the guy brings me a giant bed of spaghetti, a mountain of marinara sauce, and an uncracked lobster above it with a votive and a plate and a candle and boiling butter and an oddly cut lemon wedge like on purpose. And I'm freaking out because this has got to be the most expensive thing on the menu. And this guy totally doesn't like her having new guys in her life because she's she lives there. So she's getting the same meal every time. And he's getting her, her his her favorite meal for her. But this guy gets me the most expensive thing on the menu. And I'm freaking out internally. Like, what am I going to do? And I go, okay, Kevin, just, just, just crack the lobster, you know, and just start your meal. So I crack the lobster and a, just a bunch of marinara sauce goes all over my shirt, like Captain America's shield. 
And it's just, it's just like, it's like all over me. It's my only good white shirt that I bought a little Navy on sale in the clearance rack for $5. Uh, that's a two day shirt, by the way. <laughs> and I'm freaking out. And I go, Kevin, do something classy right now. I'm like, what does that mean? I'm like, I don't know. Figure it out, man. I'm having this inner dialogue. And I, and I go for the lemon wedge, except I, I look at Margaret and I lock eyes with her and I'm shaking. And I look at her, look at the lemon, look at her, look at the lemon. I go like that. Well, I miss my plate entirely. I squeeze the lemon as hard as I can. And I watch a stream of lemon juice fly directly into her left eye. And so it's like going like this into her eye, like a stream. And mascara is just running down her face. And she looks like the band Kiss, the film The Crow. And I'm freaking out. And this lady next to us goes, Mass, are you okay? And I was like, Smoker 67, it's a date. It's going south. You're not helping. Thank you. Leave us alone, you know? And then, um, and then I go, Kevin, do something classier right now. I'm, I'm now I'm just now I'm on overload. I'm just like, what am I going to do? I can't pay for this meal. I've, I've, I've got a mess all over myself. I've got a mess all over her. And I go for the plate of boiling butter and it tips and droplets of boiling butter fly between her blouse under her chest and they burn her. And she screams bloody murder. And the whole restaurant stops cold. And I'm like, oh my God. And I take my napkin instinctually and I go like this to wipe the butter off her. But I'm doing that right here. And she's like, what? the hell are you doing? And I was like, I don't know. I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm so sorry. And she goes, she says the only two words on a first date in the first 10 minutes you don't want to hear, check please. And I, I was like, oh, it's over. We're not going to get married. We're not going to have kids. We're not going to have a dog named Max. It's over. <laughs> and, you know, I had our whole life planned out. And so we get back to her apartment and she sees the bag by the door and she goes, oh God. She goes, Kevin, we're going to the roof. And I said, oh, yeah, are you going to throw me off? She goes, no. We go to the roof. There's these two yoga mats in a box garden. And we lay down. And she says, tell me your story. And we both fell asleep on the roof, looking at the moon, woke up in the dewy air like at 6 in the morning. And on our second date, I told her I loved her. And she said, thank you. <laughs> Hold on. Wait a minute, though. How did you pay for the dinner? I didn't. She did. Oh, God. <laughs> Dude, great first date right listen man i'll tell you what god was looking out for you with this woman or something like that. So i've never heard anybody <laughs> tell a story like that and still end up with the girl it doesn't happen man like that's <laughs> you've got you've definitely had more than more than one miracle in your life that's for sure that's true absolutely oh man that's awesome or what year did you meet her uh met her in 2004 in that third psych words day we were married in 2007 I'll take you back to um, the jump. Actually, when you were when you were falling, um, you were praying on the way down. Talk to me about about your faith and and that and how that plays a role in everything from mental health to recovery to you know in dealing with this, all that kind of stuff. So I've been part of the Catholic faith since I can remember. Um, Catholic school my whole life, um, had faith my whole life. Only time I lost faith was when I was on top of that bridge before I jumped off. I always say I found it on the way down. Uh, but I, but in praying to God on the way down, God, please save me. I don't want to die. I made a mistake. And then being in the water, God, please save me. I don't want to die. I made a mistake. Having that sea lion circle beneath me, keep me afloat until the Coast Guard boat arrived behind me. Uh, literally, the sea lion came to save my life in the water. Um, and, and after I just was praying profusely um, and having the Coast Guard pick me up and get me to the ambulance, getting to the hospital on time, you know, having the back surgeon who wasn't supposed to be there do my back surgery and replace my shattered vertebrae with titanium, all of that came into play. Um, and, and it was a large part of this miracle. And then going back to the Golden Gate Bridge uh, a year to the date of my attempt with my father, holding a flower over the rail, dropping it, having it waft down to the water, make the tiniest of ripple effects, hence the name of our film, Suicide Ripple Effect. And to the right, two feet to the right, pops up a sea lion. And it was arguably the most beautiful moment I've ever spent with my dad my entire life. But the point was like right before we dropped that flower, we prayed together, the Our Father and the Hail Mary, Hail Mary. And it was a moment in time that I'll never forget. And it was the most beautiful moment I've ever shared with my dad besides him being the best man at my wedding. Um, and I'll never, never let that go um, because it, it, it was it was like, and, and you know, I, I don't mean to be cliche, but it was like God was speaking to me in those in that in that moment. He was speaking to me when the Coast Guard boat arrived underneath me he was speaking to me when the sea lion kept me afloat like literally bumped me to the surface until the coast guard boat got there he was speaking to me when the doctor decided to stay at the hospital just a little bit longer and i come into the emergency room and he decides to do my surgery 
all these things came into play to, to, to keep me here. And I'm so very grateful because I get, I get to be here. That, that's how I look at life now. Uh, things aren't a task anymore. Things aren't difficult anymore. I get to do things. I get to be here. I get to have depression. I get to have manic, manic episodes. I get to have panic attacks. And they all can teach me a lesson if I allow them to. Because if I hold gratitude inside my pain and thanks for my faith and my hope and my my love and zest for life, then I'll always fight that pain to be here tomorrow. Yeah, it's a, you know, the the... the the language of I get to rather than I have to, like I have to live with uh, mental depression or, you know, I have to whatever. This is uh, something that I learned from um, my mental conditioning coach when I was training for, for my fights long time ago about just changing your perspective on things, you know, the way that you obviously thoughts, you know, become actions and whatnot and, uh, and, and changing your vocabulary to, I get to, it, it's, it's difficult to do when you're at the end of a, a training session, you're like, I get to do one more round of conditioning, which is amazing. <laughs> but, um, you know, seeing, seeing that, seeing that, uh, that, I don't know, I, I, I used to, I, sometimes I take, um, uh, dry race markers and I'll write things on my mirror. And at one point in time I had written on my mirror, I said, God, thank you for the trials and tribulations that I go to for the, the normal man crumbles during times of tribulation. And it's what separates me from the normal man. And so you have to be grateful for these things that you go through in your life. And I look at, I look at the, you know, the, the, the trials and tribulations you've had in your life, particularly with that one event and the, you know, obviously the prayer that comes out of it and his provision and getting you through it and all that kind of stuff. And I just think that obviously you're, you're here for a reason. You know, and the uh, many people in this world don't know what the reasoning is. Like they, they spend an entire life trying to find out their purpose in this world. But, uh, you know, clearly that your purpose has become being this beacon for not only people, I believe not only people that ha may be suffering from mental health issues, but also just uh, people like myself, because I'll, I'll say this, man, reading your book, getting to know your story and everything has been a life changing incident for me personally. Wow. That, that moves me to my core. I really appreciate that. Um, you know, that's the whole point of the book in the first place is to reach people at their core, at their gut, at their heart, um, and help them help them fight to make a change in their own lives. Uh, whether it's someone who doesn't really go through these things and they're just appreciating the book, or it's someone that goes through the, the, the struggle of mental health crisis, reads the book, and then decides to stay. You know, um, I got a new book out called The Third Rail in My Mania I Became. Uh, that just got released May 15th. Uh, you can get that at the third rail book.com. That's the number three RD book rail rail book.com. And that book is about a guy named Jesse Cohen. And it's, and he wrote the book and I was a co-author and he wrote it before he passed. And, and we had to finish the book with his lovely wife, Mari. Uh, but he lives with severe bipolar disorder in a way that I had never come across in my life. He was a Tulane law student in his back in his 20s and 1990s uh, in the height of the crime era, the organized crime era in New Orleans. And he, in his mania, he became a vigilante. He like he would be like Batman is today in, in folklore. He went around in a black suit, black tie, a black shirt, a baton, several weapons, protective gear like a bulletproof vest. Um, and he would he would use a police scanner to stop criminals from their criminal activities. Uh, he, he would get involved in stopping organized crime criminals or gangs uh, or even get involved in fighting with the KKK out there in, in Louisiana. And he was really, uh, in his manic behavior, he became this animal. He would be a Tulane law student by day, but a vigilante by night. And the stories he tells in this book will blow your mind. Um, but in the, in the initial part of the book, he talks about how to fight with, with your mania and survive your mania and, and never die by suicide. And the tragic part is Jesse did lose his battle to depression. He lost his life to suicide. Um, and even though he did, the, the, the legacy this book paints and the picture this book paints still has the power to change lives. Mm -hmm. We've gotten messages from people saying they read the book and it saved their life. So we know that it's had that effect. And so um, I, I miss Jesse every day. He was like a brother to me. And he, he, he was the 10th person in my life I would lose to suicide. I've now lost 11 people. Um, and I think about this all the time because, you know, we spent so much time together writing this book and he never gets to see the outcome. Um, well, maybe he does in a different plane of existence, I hope. I hope. Um, but we're trying to put it out there and help people with this book and 
have them recognize their true value and not end up like Jesse and, and, and not end up learning the hard way like I did. Well, I'll, uh, I'm looking forward to when that book comes out. And you said that it, uh, you, you'll be able to, you'll be able to get that through your, through your website, like go to the Kevin Hines or where, no, where? That, 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 that book's available at the third rail book.com right now or on, or on Amazon. So I just want to ask you one last question um, and turn the beat up a little bit. Where did you go on your second date? We never, we never got <laughs> we went there. See, we, we, went, we, went, <laughs> we went to go see Mo Step in concert and he didn't show up. Oh, really? Yeah, he didn't show up. How? How? Hold we on a second. Like, I thought I was waiting for this like turnaround, like comamback story that it was going to be like the most epic date ever. No, I don't know, like something no, you, we, you see on The Bachelor. We drove, we, we drove all the way out to UC Davis from San Francisco to go see Mo Step in concert, and he did not show up. And your wife, like your wife, at that point in time, had to be thinking like, okay, date one, date two. If I choose a future with this man, like Lord of Mercy, this like <laughs> nothing is working out on, right. Uh, on, day, on day two, we're driving back from. We're driving back at three in the morning from Nomo Steph. And um and uh and I told her I loved her and she's like, um, thank you. <laughs> you know, but but it, it, it ends up working out. So it's yeah. all good. <laughs> you have to you have to write another book. You you need to write another book about your love story. That would be hilarious, man. So for awesome. Sure. Okay, best way, just a real quick plug before we jump off here. Best way for uh, the listeners to get a hold of you and your information again. Best way to comment to me and have me comment back to you is youtube.com slash Kevin Hines. Okay. But I'm on all social medias at Kevin Hines Story. Yep. So LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, Instagram and TikTok. Awesome. I'll be, uh, I'll be giving you a follow right after we're done here today, man. Hey, Kevin, appreciate you coming on today. It was like great reading your book, but even better talking to you today. Thank you so much for your time, man. Thank you, Rich. Yeah. I appreciate that, brother. Yeah. Yeah. You take care today, bud. Quite Franklin is providing this podcast as a public service, but it is neither a legal interpretation nor legal advice, nor a statement of Quite Franklin policy. Reference to any specific product or entity does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation of that product or entity by Rich Franklin or Quite Franklin. The views expressed by guests on the podcast are their own, and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. Views and opinions expressed by Quite Franklin employees or representatives are the views and opinions of the persons expressing them, and do not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of Quite Franklin or any of its officials or principals. Nothing heard on this podcast at any time is medical advice or is intended as medical advice. The listener must always consult his or her personal physician or other qualified medical professional regarding any questions of a medical nature. If you have any questions about this disclaimer, please contact our general counsel.